this is one of those games that fans of both schools circled on their calendars long ago. Connecticut and St. John's meeting at Madison Square Garden, UConn leading the East. Always jam-packed outside the garden and jam-packed inside the garden here tonight. We're told ticket estimates about 60% local about 40 percent folks coming down from Connecticut to cheer on their Huskies and it's their Huskies who get the first possession of the game. Well this is a huge game for St. John's particularly they got a chance to get in the hunt in the Big East Conference standings with a win today. UConn defeated St. John's by five three weeks ago up in Connecticut. And the Johnny's looking to get a little revenge in his lens set get a big quality win as Marcus Hatton glides to the basket. Well, Marcus Adams for from scoring in the conference. He's the guy that's got to get St. John's going on the offensive end. Backdoor cut to Ron Butler. No basket, no foul. Here come the Red Storm. Patton, the former junior college All-American, rattles out. Johnny's love to get on the offensive glass. They can't corral that one. As we take it to the rolling rock starting lineups. For Connecticut, there was talk of a change. Maybe Ben Gordon getting a start in place of Tony Robertson. But Jim Calhoun has left his lineup intact. Andre Stanley, the St. John's walk-on, getting his fourth consecutive start. Eric King turned around just in time to spot that pass from Hatton. There's Stanley underneath with a miss. And we get a foul over the back on the Red Storm. Eric King picks up the first Jim Calhoun's team coming off an 11 point win over Providence Calhoun unfortunately didn't stick around to see all of it got sick about halftime after a bad meal before the game he leads his Huskies in here that's why we couldn't find a tuna sandwich in this whole that's right. <laughs> another turnover third committed already by the Huskies of course Mike Jarvis the head coach at St. John's he said before the game, you know, it's already a better season than last year. Last year, the Red Storm had a losing record, did not go to the postseason. They've already assured themselves of a winning record this year, and that would mean at least a trip to the NIT. Patton again, and he draws the foul. Well, right now, St. John's clearly the aggressor, understanding how big this game is for them. On the defensive end, during the season, they forced 20 turnovers a game. They've had their way on the defensive end. And as we mentioned, Marcus Hatton is the guy who leads St. John's on the offensive side. Leading scorer on this team, a slasher, but he's also developed a pretty reliable jump shot, especially when it's money time. He has been huge down the stretch in various games for St. John's. You can see his rank in various offensive categories in Big East games alone, just conference games. He's number one in the conference in scoring at better than 21 points per game. The St. John's have started in man. Now they've gone to a kind of sagging man, giving Connecticut plenty of room right now as you take a look at where they're set up. Look at the room Brown gets from Hatton. Look inside. Butler will make it go. What an inside-outside combination he is. Well, that's a terrific pass inside. Butler gets good position on the baseline. A good find and a good type of offensive play that you need to get your team started. Donald Emanuel, number 33 for St. John's. The big guy's actually one of their best outside shooters. He had five threes in their last game against Fairfield, and on cue, he knocks one down. Big Don Emanuel is the guy, and Mike Jarvis said, you let him shoot the threes because he's probably got the best pure <laughs> jump shot on the team. Their best shooter is their center. Their best rebounder is their point guard. What's going on? Talit Brown gets inside, and somebody got him on the arm. Well, you know, in games like this, you want to establish an aggressive tone. Going to the basket. You want to get the defenses on their heels. Connecticut is just starting. St. John's had done it. Watch Brown here on the drive. He gets fouled. A little tip on the arm. But again, an aggressive play getting into the paint. Glover picks up the foul, his first. The numbers on Brown. The sophomore out of Corona Park, New York. Everybody who sees this team on a day to day basis agreeing that he has improved from his freshman season making some better decisions. Well absolutely developing that good judgment is what it's all about in developing as a point guard. You've got the ball in your hands. You've got the key to the.
kingdom, so to speak, yeah. if you're going to find guys, get them involved. Missed both free throws. 6 2 St. John's early. Nice cut by King. The player, Mike Jarvis, says is the second most talented player on the team next to Hat. Now he wants him to play that way on a regular basis. You can see the body on him at 6'6". He could really do some damage inside. And the freshman has had some moments, but not as consistently as Mike Jarvis would like. St. John's now playing 2-3 zone, looking to change defenses on Connecticut. So getting inside. The tap no good. Stanley comes up with a loose ball. Nice bounce pass. King, 8-2 St. John's. And we have an official's timeout behind the play. Donald Emanuel appears injured, might have gotten poked in the eye. And Emanuel, under his own power, is going to make his way to the bench. Well, St. John's changing defense is looking to confuse Connecticut again, forcing the turnover, and it's the conversion off the steals that makes St. John's a tough team. Ordinarily, they're only shooting 41% from the field, but when you can steal the ball as they do 11 times a game and convert on the majority of them, you more than neutralize that poor field goal percentage. Emmanuel sits down. Kyle Cuff comes in to replace him. And into the game for Connecticut, Justin Brown, big seven-footer from Australia. His first action since breaking his hand less than two weeks ago. He's already back. Another beautiful inside, but Selby gets called for the double dribble. Well, there was that sixth defender out there, bottom of the backboard. But St. John's in a 1-3-1 now, still playing zone, but changed from the 2-3. That time, Karan Butler did a nice job of solving it. There's Justin Brown. You can see that almost like a lineman's glove he's got on his left hand, his non-shooting hand. He'll only get six or eight minutes, but Jim Calhoun believes they're big minutes because Okafor gets a rest. Stanley, offensive rebound. Hatton with an NBA distance three. And it's going to stay with St. John's. Boy, that's a 25-footer for Marcus Hatton. Well, out here at the Madison Square Garden, there are two lines, the college line and the pro line. And throughout the course of this game, you're going to see guys get confused as to which is the line they're supposed to step behind. Mike you Hayes can, checks in for Justin Brown. There you can see the can, confusion right there. You can see the difference in room that you have out there. But many of these guys are playing for the NBA anyway. So they might as well <laughs> try out tonight. Donald Emanuel back into the game now for the Red Storm. Little zone look here from Connecticut. Emanuel the miss. And the rebound to Talik Brown. Huskies on the run. And Robertson can't get the finish, but basket interference you can count. But St. John's defender absolutely grabbed the rim. No doubt about it. But Connecticut on a break of their own, a nice find, and once again going to the hole strong. It looked like Emmanuel that time. Here's Hatton down in the corner. Nice bounce pass underneath, and Glover had it rejected by Selby. That'll take us to our first TV timeout of the night. A good start for St. John's on their home court, leading by four. St. John's leading by five. Marcus Hatton, their third different point guard in three years. Eric Barkley to Omar Cook to Marcus Hatton. And here's St. John's head coach Mike Jarvis on what a difficult transition that's been. Especially when every one of them is really different I and mean, very unique in their own ways. And uh, it takes a lot of adjusting for the players. Um, I think in the end it'll make all of us better. Uh, some of us more bald than others, but uh, better. More balls. <laughs> I think that was a shot at me. Marcus Hatton. No, he wasn't talking to me. <laughs> Marcus Hatton, eight points, four rebounds, three assists, two steals. He can take a lot of shots, but at times Mike Jarvis will say, you know what? Sometimes he's too unselfish because if they're going to score, he's going to have to lead the way. He's easily the most talented and gifted offensive player they have. Well, absolutely. Three point guards in three years, it's hard to maintain chemistry and continuity. But Marcus Hatton is clearly the most explosive out of those three guys. What a recovery by Ben Gordon for the block after, again, St. John's went for the home run. Emmanuel to Stanley this time, and they're really working them over. Well, it's certainly are. You take a look again, another white shirt out in front of a blue shirt. And you got to wonder if you're Jim Calhoun, how are these guys beating my guys back? 
Usually it's the team that plays Connecticut that gets worried about getting beat. But it's the Huskies who have been getting beat tonight. What a recovery though by Gordon. Eventually Glover draws the foul. And he's going to go to the line. A senior who actually could still be part of the program next year. He's a partial qualifier back in his first year. If he can graduate with his class and he's on pace to do that, Len, then he's got the option of coming back for one more season. Well, that's a terrific reward for a young man who's worked so hard to get where he is. And you talk about working hard in the classroom. Certainly he's done that and he's done that out here on the floor again throughout his career at 6 6 constantly battling inside the paint guy three four inches taller than him using his body using his smarts to get the job done largest lead of the night for St. John's 25 18 Ben Gordon got caught in the air and there's another turnover as Connecticut literally is giving this one away right now. Well they're totally confused right now. There was another defense a triangle and two that St. John's ran and once again Connecticut could not figure it out. One of the reasons is they're not moving the ball enough to get it figured out. You move the ball enough the defense will reveal itself then you can solve. It. They but are if you one pass and a shot. You're never going to solve. It. They're awfully lucky to be down only seven. Eric King back into the game and out for the storm elevates can't get the finish. Glover hustling to try and keep it, and it will stay with the Red Storm. You know, the scrappier a game is, and the more of a street fight the game is, the better off St. John's is. Tristan Smith now on the floor, backup point guard. Connecticut right now in a 2 3. St. John's looking to force the issue. You know, the ball the arrow will keep it with St. John's. See the difference between St. John's and one or two passes and go to the basket is that they're going to the basket aggressively, forcing the defense to reveal itself in that fashion, finding open men. But UConn on the other end, it's one pass and a jump shot. Nice ball movement there. Stanley gets it inside. King got it. Nice job by King sneaking along the baseline to that short corner. King out of Lincoln High, the only player in his school's history with a thousand points, a thousand rebounds, and 500 blocks. Well, there's a stuff on the offensive end by Abeka Okafor. He's making his presence known. Okafor now with four, the conference's leading shot blocker, doing it at the offensive end as well. UConn back in man to man once again. Daniel got away with a push right there. St. John's a little stalled. This is not the rhythm that they had in the last couple of possessions. No. Nope. And maybe in part, Hatton's not in the game right now. Settled for the jumper. King, no. Rebound, Selby. Large part, Dan. Yeah. And guess who's at the scorer's table? Talik Brown, nowhere to go. A time, but now the arrow will keep it with the Huskies. Here comes Marcus Hatton back into the game. We told you in conference he's averaging 39 minutes per game. How about the Notre Dame game today? Quadruple overtime. The Irish beat the Hoyas. And everybody piling up. Mike Sweetney had 35 points, 20 rebounds. I think that's the first ever 30 20 game in Big East history. Butler inside. Catch you the next time those guys have to run positioning drills. They're going to thank their coaches. <laughs> Chris Thomas for Notre Dame played all 60 minutes in that quadruple overtime game here today. Well, he's a freshman. He's young. He's got young legs. <laughs> Tough hands it off for Hat. Tough cover here for Gordon. Out of bounds. It'll stay with St. John's as we bring you up to date on some of the other, all of the other Big East action earlier today. A huge win for Notre Dame. Not just the score and four overtimes, but the Irish. And now 17 and 6, 7 and 3 in the conference. And how about Villanova picking up a big win up at the pavilion, knocking off UCLA? Well, it just shows again the competitive nature of the Big East Conference is not intro. Yep. There's Stanley after yet another turnover. And Hatton is blocked from behind by Okafor, and then Okafor fouls Stanley. You know, as time has gone on throughout the season, there are a lot of teams like Villanova that have improved, and now outside of the conference, they're competing better. And here you take a look at Stanley. Once again, we talk about that chemistry. Leads the break nicely, delivers the ball when he needed to. 
Already five blocks tonight for Okafor, who leads the conference at just over four per game. Danielle Marshall, he might, Okafor might break his block record. And now Jim Calhoun wants a piece of Tony Green, one of the officials. I don't know if we've had a technical call, but Jim Calhoun is irate, and there's a the technical. That's his second, and I think he's gone. There must have been the first because both officials signal that Calhoun is out. Well, we talked about the pace of this game. It obviously has been a breakneck pace, but it's also been a physical game. And I think at this point in time, Jim Calhoun is arguing to allow these guys to play a little bit of defense. I think he also probably felt that the bulk of the calls that have gone against these guys in the last few minutes have been made by one official. Well, Calhoun's still on the floor. Both officials appear to signal that that was the second tee and that he is gone. And I think now John Cal is waiting for Jim Calhoun to leave the floor. Connecticut has also apparently called a timeout. Calhoun still wants to get at Tony Green, and that's the one official who he has yet to speak with because Green's keeping his distance right now. Team will be turned over to associate head coach Dave Lato as Calhoun takes his leave. Well, you take a look at Tony Green right there pointing to the bench. And that's probably where the first technical occurred. And I'm sure Jim originally goes over there to find out what did I say. But certainly intimidating in his motion. Bob Donato saying step back step back and it was Donato who gave him the second technical and threw him out of the game Tony Green got in there as well a little bit late but it was definitely Green who first got under the skin of Jim Calhoun and Calhoun wanted to know what that first technical was for and I think Bob Donato made the call because as he told Jim Calhoun to back off Jim did it. But then he started back towards Green again, and that's when Donato made the call. There's Dave Lado, the associate head coach, who will take over, as he did a few nights ago against Providence. Then when Calhoun was ill, tonight with Calhoun being ejected. And now Marcus Hatton's going to spend a little while at the line, shooting technicals for, shooting free throws for these two technicals. And then remember, when all this is done, Andre Stanley's going to go to the line. Boy, nothing gets a hometown crowd riled up, too, like the visiting coach getting tossed out of the game. Well, I think it's gotten the visiting crowd riled up, too. <laughs> there are an awful lot of Husky fans here. dozen points. St. John's now up by nine and now Andre Stanley's going to get a couple of free throws after the foul that seemed to occur well, about 10 minutes ago now. Well it's going to be interesting to see how the Huskies respond to this. I mean it's certainly early enough to come back from a potential 11 point deficit. But this is going to be a question of how much fight in them can Dave Lado muster. I don't know if Andre Stanley might have some blood on his uniform perhaps as he's been called over to the bench. So he's going to have to leave and looks like is it Donald Emanuel is going to come off the bench perhaps to shoot the free throws in Stanley's place. And you know all that time it took after the technical Marcus had to shoot the free throws you'd have thought that somebody would have recognized that <laughs> and repaired it before Stanley gets to the line. So Stanley loses a chance to had his scoring total so Emmanuel 74 percent free throw shooter comes off the bench. Well, he's 30 percent better than Stanley so it works <laughs> to St. John's benefit. Maybe that's why they didn't see it. St. 
Johns making it happen at the line. Hatton hitting all four of the technical free throws. Emmanuel, a senior, coming off a career high 20 point game against Fairfield on Wednesday. So six consecutive free throws for the Johnnies, and this is their largest lead of the night. Stanley taken care of, so he can get back into the game whenever Mike Jarvis wants. Yeah, this is one of those dark areas that somebody like Karan Butler is going to have to take his team on his shoulders, give them some confidence, lead him out of it. Against the zone, though, it's going to require a lot of ball movement, but still, you like to see Butler be able to create some things for his team. He's got 10 of their 22. Ben Gordon creates. What a tough shot. I would expect a freshman to step up and do that. He may be a freshman, but he sure doesn't play like one, and he's got a huge future at Connecticut. That's what it's going to take someone. I picked on Butler because he is the leading scorer. But somebody's got to step up right now and show the way. Hatton in trouble. And they'll tie him up. The arrow will St. keep it with St. John's. A couple of times tonight about the only thing really that Hatton has done wrong on occasion is over penetrate and getting some difficulty. Well, again, you look at Marcus Hatton. He's not a pure point guard. He's kind of a lead guard, but he's the guy in whose hands you want that ball because of his creative capability. Here comes Stanley back in, bandaged up. A guy who all season had only played 29 minutes until three games ago, got a surprise start, and in the last three games has averaged about 33 minutes per game and hasn't hurt them at all. Left alone in the corner, not really a shooter. Gets most of his points in transition or on the offensive glass. Spinning inside, 15-footer rattles out, a rebound Hayes. Robertson kicks it on the wing. Gordon has five quick points for UConn. And we told you, there's some Husky fans here. There's no question about it. Once again, you've got to admire the way Connecticut has responded to the adversity. Coach gets tossed. They're down 12, 11 or 12, and they come right back. 10 on the night for Ben Gordon. UConn back within six. Hatton again the turnaround. Well off in the rebound of the Huskies. And a travel is the call. Fifteen Connecticut turnovers. Jim Calhoun ejected. But UConn making some noise getting back within six. St. John's leading Connecticut by 9, 44 35. This conference loaded with a great freshman, a couple in this game. Let's take a look at some of the better first year players. Emeka Okafor for UConn leading the conference in block shots at better than four per game. Fourth and rebounding at nine. Chris Thomas, what can you say about the Irish freshman point guard? The guy who played 60 minutes today in the four overtime win over Georgetown. And Jonathan Hargett, who came in to the season, I think, with more hype than any other freshman. Okafor for Connecticut. Uh, ben Gordon, obviously, we've seen from him tonight that he certainly deserves to be on this list. Ryan Gomes having a great year as well. Well, certainly Ryan Gomes has been very quiet but very effective for Providence. Averaging double figures, had a couple of tremendous games for that team. But the bottom line is people always talk about this conference as being down. Well, you see a glimpse of the future. And quite honestly, considering the way these guys are playing, the future is now. Yep. You combine that with the stars already established, Troy Bell, Karan Butler, I'd say this conference is doing okay. So let me give you a vote. Who's your freshman of the year in the Big East? <laughs> Come on. Put your money where your mouth is. It, huh? is. it is close enough. The season's not over. Well, a lot of contact underneath. Again, bodies on the floor as they tie it up. And this is another thing. When you think about the Big East, you think about three, four players down on the floor wrestling for the ball. And I think an argument certainly can be made for Okafor as, as well as Chris Thomas, who in the last couple of weeks, you see, again, a lot of contact underneath. UConn not getting the benefit of yeah. it. And I can hear Jim Calhoun in the back <laughs> saying, I told you, I told you. If you missed it earlier, Calhoun ejected. Picked up two technicals, one right after the other, midway through the first half. The Huskies have yet to make a field goal here this half. And here's St. John's playing at 1 3 1. Brown's got to recognize it and be able to do what he did in the first half drive against it. Gordon does. Gordon floating a little bit as he launched that shot. Now that ball hit the rim, so that shot clock should not have gone off. That ball should have still been in play. Again, Ben Gordon kind of flattened out. Looked as though he was going to try to get into the paint and, and put some pressure on that defense. 
But the bottom line is, you're right. UConn gets a new 35. Malik Brown 0 for 7 from the floor tonight. And he's barking out directions again, looking to recognize the defense. Got people in the right spot and made it happen like that. And Selby with a great hesitation under the basket. Excellent job by Talik Brown just to get the people in the right spots to make that play happen. That's their first made field goal of the second half. But still, St. John's can't put him away. Seven point game. UConn beat St. John's 75 70 in stores three weeks ago as Hatton is fouled. The home team has won the last five games in this series between Connecticut and St. John's. Well, there's a situation right there with Talik Brown. He makes a, a good heady play on the offensive end and then a play that he'd rather forget on the defensive end. You do not foul a jump shooter. You know, we talked about Marcus Hatton, a terrific offensive player, but more of a slasher type. On a straight up jump shot, you want to put your hand in his face. And as far as he's concerned, hope for the worst rather than put him on the line. Third foul on Brown. Hatton now seven for eight from the line tonight. And that foul is going to send Brown to the bench as Robertson comes back in. So now Ben Gordon will be operating pretty much as the point guard. And he struggled in that role against St. John's three weeks ago, turning it over six times. Well, we saw what he was capable of doing on the offensive end. Him playing the point may ultimately stifle that offensive instinct. And the guy who's going to be guarding a Marcus Hatton is third in the country in steals. So this is going to be a tough sequence, a tough few minutes here for Ben Gordon. Well, again, if you're UConn, you hope Gordon has the confidence now after coming off a nice half. He's gotten into the flow. Also has to defend Hatton, who forces the issue and draws the foul. We got to give Marcus Hatton some credit right now. That is just street savvy right there. Recognizing the foul situation. Recognizing he's got a freshman on him. He gets him on his hip. And he just takes him for a walk in the park. And it was Robertson coming over to help who picked up the foul. That's three on Tony Robertson. Next on ESPN into the Big 12. Kareem Rush and Missouri visiting Baylor. Going to give it 9 Eastern right here on ESPN. Missouri trying to get on track again and hang with the leaders in the Big 12. Kansas picked up another win today. Oklahoma survived at Texas A&M. Well, how about Kansas scoring 100 points? It seems almost every time out. Well, they certainly have the firepower. I think this team is different from the past Kansas team. They don't care about history. They've got the horses. They've got the quickness on the perimeter. Shelby. Too strong on the jumper, and there's Hatton coming up with a loose ball. Averages better than five rebounds per game. And when Selby's taking jumpers from the free throw line and beyond, there's nobody in there to rebound. Now Robertson can't stay with Hatton, fouls him again, and that'll be four on Robertson. And now Talib Brown's going to have to come back in. Well, in theory, these three guards rotating among the two backcourt spots. It's a great rotation for Connecticut, but they're starting to run into some foul trouble here tonight. Fordham underneath. 12-point lead, St. John's. Timeout, Utah. Dave Lato filling in for Jim Calhoun, dealing with UConn's largest deficit of the night. St. John's trying to come up with what would be a huge win for them here tonight, leading UConn by 12. Tomorrow night here on ESPN at 8 Eastern, follow the trials and tribulations of a juvenile prison high school age football team as they get let out of jail only to play football. The season behind bars presented by Circuit City. Also tomorrow night, part of the interruption, Sports Century 1980 and Sidelines LA Hoops presented by Gatorade, all part of The Block on ESPN. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. And for more blocks, we present oh, no. Omeka Okafor. Oh, oh. Well, I'll tell you what, a lost start. But this young man truly understands the art of defense. He blocks shots, but you notice he doesn't swat them out of bounds. He doesn't send them to the third row only to give the opponent another possession. He makes sure his team gains possession.
And for people who are watching, kids who can block shots at home, that's the way you do it. There's a terrific move inside by Karan Butler. You talked earlier tonight about him taking the bump and being able to finish in close, and he did it there. Well, he's got that upper body strength, but he's got to do more of it for the Husky. 6 7 2 35 at this end. Let's see if Okafor's aggressiveness is affected by the fact that he's got three fouls. Well, again, I suspect he's going to exercise some judgment. You know, he'll utilize his instincts, but it looks as though he's going to create some contact. He'll have to back off. Cup a big guy, but likes to shoot from outside. Gets it inside the Glover. Still loose, and they'll tie it up. The ball will stay with St. John's. Take a look here. Now watch how quick his feet are. Glover gets position. Watch him jump in front right there, and he still gets back in position in between Glover and the basket. I'm telling you, you just can't teach that. Another inbounds play, and an easy one again for Sharif Dave Leto up on his feet over on the Yukon bench. Strong drive from Talik Brown. You know, the way this conference is going, uh, it's obvious that you can't tell who's going to win a game, no matter what the rankings are, what the one loss records are, who's playing at home. None of that seems to matter this year. This conference is so wide open right now. So many teams think they have a chance to make it to the NCAA tournament. Willie Shaw with a long three. Well, it's about talent distribution, also about mental toughness. You know, whoever can withstand the adversity sometimes are the ones who succeed. A block by Glover on Butler. Well, with Notre Dame, there's a foul on Glover. He was just trying to hang on to the ball, swung the elbow, and knocked down Hayes, number two on Glover. Now, that's always a tough call when you've got the rebound, you got possession, and someone's all over you. You're trying to free yourself to make the pass, and right there, that's literally the same type of play that we had a chance to see this afternoon in the Villanova UCLA game. On that play, there was no call. I think it was Ricky Wright who had the rebound and actually made contact with one of the UCLA players, again, trying to free himself to pass the ball. Well, in this situation, that shows you how difficult that type of judgment play is. UConn with the ball down 10 midway through the second half. And Butler is back. It's going to be Marcus Hatton. Number two on him. And never mind the individual fouls, but eventually the team fouls are going to start piling up for the Johnnies. But it's UConn with bigger foul problems right now. Robertson with four. And Hatton has to recognize that. I mean, he still has a comfortable cushion. Ten point lead right now with two free throws. You don't want to demonstrate to the officials. You don't want to get them watching you. You want to stay aggressive. Don't defocus if you're St. John. Stay focused on what you have to do. Already nine team fouls committed by St. John's here in the second half. You start worrying about the officials, it cuts down on your ability to remain aggressive. Madison Square Garden, New York City. 52-44, St. John's leading Connecticut. St. John's 15 and 7, 5 and 5 in the conference. Connecticut 15 and 5, 7 and 2 in the Big East. The best mark of any team in the Big East. See, if you're playing Marcus Hatton, that's where you want him. You want him right out there. If he puts it on the floor and penetrates, you're in trouble. Stanley back into the game. Hatton, long three as the shot clock winds down, and he almost banked it in. Look out, look out, you boy. That's a couple of big fellas heading for the sideline. In Hayes and Glover. As you mentioned, Hatton almost makes a liar out of me with a 30-foot <laughs> bank. But then you take a look at the hustle. Both those guys, instead of screaming at him like that silly fan, he should be applauding the hustle. Sometimes I don't understand these folks watching these games, man. And now, crowd really getting into it. Connecticut getting back into it, down only eight. Ooh, almost turned it over. Butler, a little bit of room on the baseline. Can't finish. And the rebound to Glover, who is having a big night on the glass. He's already got 11 boards. Emmanuel with a strong move on the baseline. Donald Emmanuel stepping forward. You know, we talked about him of late. 
Put up big plays and big games. There's a drive on the baseline. A lot of folks would have played him for that jump shot that he usually settles for. But right here, puts it on the floor with the left hand. Nice job in making himself big in his explosion to the basket. Big time move for Donald Emanuel. Coming off a 20-point game against Fairfield Wednesday, looking for his 10th point here tonight. Can't get it. And Oka for the rebound. Butler finds Gordon. Which way? It's an offensive foul on Ben Gordon as Marcus Hatton takes the charge. Nice break. Good job by Butler. Now that's a bad call. That's a bad call. You cannot set up once a player leaves his feet. If that happens and contact is made, that's a foul on the defender. Once the guy's in the air, you can't run to the spot. Stanley being pressured, gets away from two Huskies, finds Emmanuel, and Okafor rips down another rebound. So Luke Brown speeding up the court, no call on that one. And now Ben Gordon knocks one down, his first points of the second half. And you don't want to harp on the officiating, but when you don't make the consistent calls, the players don't know how to respond in that situation. Hatton leans in. Is it Okafor? It is. Emeka Okafor just picked up his fourth. And Mike Jarvis is asking for the charge on the other end on the other play. And that's the confusion that we're talking about. A potentially devastating blow to UConn inside as Okafor comes out. Hayes in. See how long he stays out. You've got Okafor and Robertson. Two Huskies with four. Patton ran with his 10th made free throw tonight in 12 tries. Well, that's what I was saying about Marcus Hatton. If you can get him to go east west along the perimeter, you've accomplished something. You let him start going north south, putting it on the floor, creating. You're going to have to foul him, otherwise, you're going to wind up getting. Burn in some way, shape, or form. First team junior college All American last year, originally from Baltimore. 20 points on the night for Marcus Hatton. St. John's leads by 10. This ball fake from Talik Brown, and the floater goes. And right now, look at the, the run out right here. Out hustling. You gone once again. The fourth time tonight that St. John's has gone over the top. For a try and an easy layup, and that time Stanley gets the deuce. Gordon for three. Gordon the rebound. Gordon again. I think what Ben Gordon did was redeem himself because on the last possession, when Talik Brown penetrated, Gordon has to rotate back and cover, and that's what Brown is talking to him about. But an excellent job right there. Take a look here on the offensive rebound. And again, another aggressive move to the basket. But Ben Gordon probably felt he had to do something. Because on the play before when St. John's got the easy layup, Brown's penetration left the middle and the long pass wide open. And Gordon's job to rotate back. 20th point of the night for the freshman Ben Gordon who pretty much single-handedly is keeping Connecticut in this game right now. The Fire State Building, we are thrilled to be here in New York City tonight, and this game has had a New York kind of feel to it. From the moment we walked into Madison Square Garden here tonight, it, you knew it was going to be some kind of a game between Connecticut and St. John's. As we mentioned off the top, it's one of those games that the fans of both teams circle on their calendars right at the beginning of the season. Let's look at the Nike storyline tonight. Jim Calhoun didn't hang around long tonight. A couple of technicals midway through the first half. Connecticut awful taking care of the ball in the first half. Better in the second. But St. John's with Marcus Hatton scoring and just let all-round hustle plays. Glover, Stanley, everybody doing the little things for St. John's right now, helping them to, to stay in the lead. And what they've been able to do is with Stand some Connecticut runs. Every time Connecticut seems to get close within five or so, St. John's finds a way to withstand that run and go on one of their own. And obviously, as time goes down and they're trying to shave time off this clock, you got a guy like Hatton who can handle it and make things happen. Boy, Stanley is good around the rim. He's not all that big, about 6'4, but you give him the ball in the paint, he's going to find a way. 
And on that play, it looked as though Hatton had fumbled it. UConn calling for a double dribble. Six tonight for Stanley. Gordon. Nice look. Selby. He's left-handed, and it paid off for him there. Now, if I'm UConn, I drop back in a pretty tight zone. They look as though they want to play man-to-man, -man, but you got to play a tight zone. you got to force St. John's out of their comfort level, and you got to get the ball out of Marcus Hatton's hand. He's the guy that's creating everything. I wouldn't let him get it back. St. John's 10th in the conference in field goal percentage and dead last 14 in three-point percentage. But when Hatton gets inside, Cuff had it, lost it, and Talik Brown stepped out of bounds. And even though Hatton missed that layup, you see the havoc it created. A couple of offensive tips, and they still have possession. You cannot allow him to dictate the course of the half-court offense if you're UConn. You know, still amazing though, Len. It's only a seven-point game. It's felt like about 15 most of the night, but St. John's just can't put UConn away. Now here's the zone right here. This is what you got to do. Forces the turnover on the red store. I didn't say anything. Pictures worth a thousand words. You could have patted yourself on the back there a little bit. It wasn't room. You were doing it for me, Dan. <laughs> Connecticut playing still with Robertson and Okafor on the bench, each with four fouls. The way Robertson has played tonight and the way Gordon has played tonight. Don't know if Robertson would get back in, but Okafor is certainly a guy they'd love to have on the floor. And now, if you're UConn and you're attacking the St. John's zone, you got to go side to side obviously make the zone shift a little inside out looking for Gordon make that zone contract and allow your shooters to step up Brown trying to penetrate go. Gordon for three tap back in by Butler that's the other benefit of playing against the zone you get a tenacious offensive rebounder on that glass like Karan Butler he's going to have his way and Mike Johnson knows it and wants to talk about it and now all the noise is coming from the upper levels of seats here at Madison Square Garden where the UConn fans are. And why not? Karan Butler, 17 points and 10 rebounds in tonight's game. Second straight double-double. Well, there's a good shot but Ben Gordon. You take a look at the hand right there. Yeah, I think that was Butler getting in there. Well, it doesn't matter. He said it was him. <laughs> Got to give the young man the benefit of the doubt. More basketball coming your way tomorrow on ABC at 2.30 Eastern time. A couple of games, including one out of the Big East and another very big game in this conference, Miami. Number 11 in the country taking on Boston College. Others will see number 12, Oklahoma State, visiting Fresno State. Barry Clark's Miami Hurricanes right on the heels of Connecticut in the East Division of the Big East Conference. And you can see that if St. John's can win this game and hand Connecticut a loss, Miami's got a tough one at BC tomorrow. St. John's plays Miami this week. The Johnnies within the span of a week could be thinking first or could be stuck in sixth in this division. You never know. And that's what I talked about, that crab in the barrel mentality. When you have a chance to pull one of those crabs ahead of you down, you got to yeah. do it. Glover inside, lots of hands. And over in the West, just as congested, really, with Pittsburgh, Syracuse, and now Notre Dame all up near the top. And Pitt plays Syracuse tomorrow. How about, how about Mike Gray and Notre Dame? Five wins in a row. That tough four overtime game today. He's got those guys rolling. I think freshman Chris Thomas is finally assuming leadership and ownership of that team. And everybody's stepping in behind him. 22 points, 12 assists today for Thomas. Which way is it going to go? Connecticut ball. And still talking about the Big East. Obviously, the question is, what happened to Boston College? I mean, this is a team that's been so good for so long in the last two years, and suddenly it seems as though they've fallen off the table and it's punctuated by a loss of Virginia Tech. They need that game yeah. against Miami. Villanova coming off a win over UCLA today. And by the way, on Big Monday, it'll be these Connecticut Huskies taking on Villanova. Selby, good screen. Brown gets inside. Strong to the hoop. It's a three-point game. And you can tell the momentum has changed. The aggression has taken the side of the Yukon Huskies. They're the ones going to the basket. They're the ones who are doing it with abandon. And St. John's a bit tentative offensively. Glover nowhere to go. Hayes stood his ground. Connecticut ball. And all of this happening on the UConn defensive end with Okafor on the bench. 
All we have to do is run a series of expressions from Louis Carnesecca tonight, and you'll be able to tell how this game's been going for the Johnnies. He's as up and down as everybody else in this building. They dive now in a man-to-man. -man. They recognize they've got to generate some energy. From that defense comes their offensive set. Selvin, good look. Couldn't get it to go. Glover the rebound, and now Marcus Hatton wants a little bit of composure. Once again, if I'm UConn, there's the zone, or at least what appears to be a zone. Stanley for three! You know what? You got to live with that. You got to live with that. In a situation like that, if Andre Stanley is going to beat you, then you deserve to be beaten. Walk on Andre Stanley hits his first three pointer of the season and St. John's lead is back to six. Well, we talked about Andre Stanley giving St. John's what they need. And again, terrific opportunity and certainly he makes the most of it. Now well, we talked about Stanley the walk on stayed home here at St. John's to care for his mother who was suffering from diabetes and we asked Mike Jarvis earlier today about Stanley not only what he does on the floor but he talks about what an inspiration Stanley has been off the court as well. What Andy Stanley means is that you know uh, almost anything's possible and those people who give the most get rewarded and in Andre for what he is giving to his mother and what he gives just to come to practice at 7.30 in the morning, you know, getting up at 5.30, taking the train, taking the bus, and being there every day and just hanging in there and waiting and waiting and waiting for his turn and then making the most of it. It's almost like, in a way, it's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's just a great story, a great sports and human interest story. Well, certainly his mom has to be proud. You heard Mike Jarvis say that he gets up at 5.30 in the morning. You know, you got to recognize what it takes to go to a 7.30 a.m. practice and then go to class. I can tell you one thing, his mother's proud, and at 10 p.m., she knows exactly where her child is <laughs> in bed. That's right. Brown runs it down, good trap, and a timeout taken by Connecticut. Well, that's what Mike Jarvis said. Not once all year, not once did Andre Stanley complain, passed up other scholarship offers to stay at St. John's as a walk-on so he could help care for his mother, score the last seven points. He's made four starts for St. John's. He's had nine points, nine points, eight points, nine points in those four games. And that doesn't even talk about all the intangibles, the effort, the hustle, the loose balls, all the little things he does on the floor as well. Coming up next, more NCAA action out of the Big 12. It'll be Missouri and Baylor. Top of the hour right here on ESPN. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. We hope they have as much fun at that game as we are having at this game. Chris Marlowe, John Sunderbolt standing by in Waco. This has been, you knew it was going to be close. Connecticut to beat St. John's by five at Gamble just a few weeks ago. It was a one-point game in the final minute. And here St. John's has had a lead as high as 12. Connecticut got it down to three on a couple of occasions this half. It's six right now. Seven seconds on the shot clock for the Huskies. Exactly four minutes to play in the game. Well, again, you know the play was designed in that huddle. It's going to be a question of execution. Well, it's falling apart here now. It'll be Brown for three. Got it off. Got the rim. Selby the rebound. Tip no good. Boy, what an effort. A travel called on Selby. He slams the ball to the floor. And is he lucky to not get a technical? And look at Dave Lato, 30 feet out onto the floor. A ton of emotion here in the garden tonight. St. John's and Connecticut going at it with this game meaning so much to both teams. Six point lead for the Red Storm, 346 to play. From New York, timeout situation, foul situation. St. John's with a six point lead. Emeka Okafor back into the game. Sat out about five minutes after picking up his fourth foul. Great sequence, great effort going into that timeout. UConn getting on the offensive glass. And then Johnny Selby called for the travel as he fell to the floor with the ball upset. He slammed the ball off the court and was very lucky not to get teed up. They certainly want to give the officials a lot of credit for restraint in that situation. They could have very easily given Selby a technical and justified it and obviously it would have put Connecticut in a much deeper hole than they're already in. 
And now the uh, clock, I believe, did not start as Marcus Hatton came in. So they're going to stop things and maybe take a couple of seconds off. They've already taken one more, now two more off from when the play stops. So 32 on the shot clock, 3.43 left of the game, St. John's by six. Don't forget over on ESPN News we will have a post game report on this game just a few minutes from now. I shouldn't say that given that Notre Dame and Georgetown went to four overtimes today. <laughs> Who knows how long we're going to be here tonight. Here's Hat. Stanley hit the huge three last time down to remember he has scored their last seven points. And look how much room Butler has given Stanley when he had the ball. Glover dips the shoulder misses the shot Emmanuel going over the back loose ball finds the Huskies. Brown probing looking for room finds Gordon for three that would have been huge right there Selby again but the loose ball comes to half. Well UConn just can't push it over. And I think Mike Jarvis got teed up. Oh boy. Oh no. No nope, he called it on Dave Lazo. Or is it a timeout. What's going on. No, Bob Donato called, over called explaining. Called the technical on Dave Lazo. And I think he was obviously screaming on the last play. Fight for the offensive rebound. He believed that there should have been a call. It is Lato who has been teed up. Jim Calhoun ejected in the first half after picking up two technicals. Marcus Hatton knocked down all four free throws then, and it's Hatton back of the line now. Well, Mike Jarvis thought it was on him because he had <laughs> that look like what? I'll tell you what, this is obviously not the time to get a tee, especially with Hatton as hot as he is yep. on the line. But, you know, at some point in time, you got you to gotta keep your powder dry. Marcus Hatton now 13 for 15 from the line tonight. Coming up next, Missouri and Baylor. We're going to send you there as soon as this one is over. Chris Marlowe, John Sunderbolt are ready to go. A little bit of poise as St. John's is going to use as much clock as they can. But again, once Hatton gives up the ball, you can't let him get it back. You got to overplay him because he's the guy that makes it happen. Back rim, another offensive rebound for St. John's and a foul. Turnovers, technicals, and offensive rebounding. Big stories here tonight. You know, as I say, I know it's very difficult. To deny a guy, particularly a guy as quick as Marcus Hatton, but you got to put more effort into doing it. You know, make St. John's go away from him. You take a look at the offensive rebounds, that's going to kill in Connecticut as well. The quickness of St. John's, the spacing, and certainly the tenacity. Glover, a 68% free throw shooter on the season. As a team, they've been doing an outstanding job from the line tonight. They played us to make a substitution to get Tony Robertson back into the game for Johnny Selby. They need all the three-point shooters they can find. Robertson with another very quiet night. Long rebound. Good point, good call. The push off by Fordham. And now they walk the floor and shoot him at the other end. Two free throws the rest of the way, both sides. You can see that one coming. Sharif Fordham obviously outmanned on that side. He so saw his eyes light up when the ball came off, and it was almost a reflex action to keep Okafor away. But it's not what you want to do at this point in time, stopping the clock and giving Connecticut an opportunity to score. Okafor to the line for the first time tonight. Texas 6 9 240 and now Selby Johnny Selby's at the scorers table and waiting to get called back in Robertson will go out so Dave Lato is going to bring in Selby for defense and then try to get Robertson back in for offense and now we've got another argument over the scorers table and Dave Lato wants to know what's going on again. Well, these officials uh, have had their work cut out for them from the moment this game began, haven't they? 
Well, you mentioned it from the beginning. I mean, here the game is being played in New York. It had a New York attitude. Nothing is good enough. <laughs> Nothing is good enough. What do you think it is? Some kind of a timing issue, perhaps, that Dave Lado is concerned about? Maybe that. It may be the question of the award. Actually, both teams are way over the limit, so in approaching the, the penalty, the double penalty. So you know, I don't think that that's an issue. And right now, Mike Jarvis is the guy who needs an explanation. So whatever the issue was, Dave Lado may have gotten his way. I mean, the only thing they could talk about is it one and one, or is it um, two shot foul? It's got to be two. Right. Well, what else could they talk yeah. about? And it definitely was Okafor that Ford went over the back on down to the other end. And now John Powell and Bob Donato are going to do the smartest thing and just walk away from the coaches and try to get it sorted out themselves. Now, whoever they go back to is losing the argument. You know that. If we get some kind of a word as to what all that was about, we'll pass it on to you. As it stands, Okafor hit the first. <laughs> it's a substitution. Following the missed two shots, foul shot. There was no time. No time coming off the clock, so Selby couldn't come back in, and Robinson couldn't go back out. One more free throw coming for Okafor. Selby waits to check back in. Certainly, the way to solve that is to make the free throw. Yeah, that's right. That's all you got to do. That'll be a moot point. And now again, John Cowell puts a halt to the proceedings. Man, oh man, we're getting there, guys. Missouri and Baylor coming up next here on ESPN. Just want to make sure everyone knew there's one shot left. Six point game. How about Okafor with about three minutes between free throws and he hadn't shot any all night until these two and he calmly knocks them both down. You know, I think the matchup right now benefits UConn. You got the quickness of Robinson out there playing another guard. Pat wild shot. Loose ball to St. John's and Glover is fouled. Karan Butler is going to get called for the foul. It kind of looked like Lever ran into his own guy for them more than he ran into Butler. Well, Butler was called for reaching over, and that was the correct call. But the ball is up in the air, and you got to make an effort to go after the ball. I mean, it looked like suspended animation. Watch the wild shot straight up in the air. Now watch. It gets tipped. And there's Butler on the back of Glover. He did run into yep. his own man, but unfortunately, from the angle the official had, his contact. Glover missed a couple about a minute ago. It's his ninth point of the night to go with 14 rebounds. Not bad for a guy 6'6. Six, six. Robertson gets his man in the air, strong to the basket, and a block is the call. Now Robertson's going to shoot a couple, as this has turned into a free throw contest. And once again with St. John's, you got to tighten that defense. There he gets Emmanuel off his feet. And once again, the call is made, this time the correct call. Robertson takes off, the defender now steps to the spot. And once a player has left his feet, you cannot step to a position underneath him. A few moments ago, actually UConn was the victim of a mistake in that judgment. Robertson with two huge misses, an 82% shooter on the season. And you've got to think that whatever's bothering him the last few days, unable to shoot well during games, that confidence is now definitely becoming a factor. Right, something's in his head right now. And I think 
for the sake of that team, you need to put somebody out there that's going to be able to execute. At no, and Butler taps it out of bounds, so it's St. John's ball. And one other factor that's creeped in right now is that UConn is tired. I mean, you can see Karad Butler, he can barely keep his feet right now. So now this is fatigue setting in. You got a deep St. John's team that's been shuttling players in and out, and yeah. it's paying dividends that's right, right now. St. John's has 10 players averaging better than 10 minutes per game. UConn is really more of a seven or eight man team. And again, UConn's got to play again in 48 hours. Big Monday against Villanova. Coming up next, Missouri and Baylor here on ESPN. Missouri off to an early nine point lead at last report. We'll send you to Chris Marlowe and John Sunbold when this one is done. Yeah, they follow the schedule, huh? For a little artwork as well. That's nice. One way to get your sign on TV. What a win this would be for St. John's. It would have moved them to six and five in the conference. 16 and seven overall. A team that was just 14 and 15 last year and didn't go anywhere in the postseason. They know they've got a winning record assured this year. They know they're at least going to go to the NIT. But 16 and seven, six and five, with a win over Miami, with a win over Wake Forest, potentially with a win over Connecticut. They're starting to put a bit of a resume together. Again, Fordham breaks wide open on the inbounds pass, and you wonder why is UConn staying with the zone of the inbound? That's three times in a row now on the underneath inbounds, but Sharif Fordham has gotten a wide open layup, and Dave Lato is as frustrated as anyone. Take a look right here. Here he is. He's just going to go right there. Nobody keeping an eye on him. Just hanging around. And Okafor came over to commit the foul, and that is his fifth. So Okafor is gone and now Dave Lato is going to take a little time which he's allowed to do to make the substitution. He's going to call his players over. It's only seven points still with a minute thirty nine to go but UConn running out of players as we check in with Brian. Kennedy. And Dan let's drop in on that game just mentioned Missouri and Baylor underway and well, Missouri would get up early and Kareem Rush knocking down a three. It's now 15 to 8. Seven point lead underway in Waco. Okay. Brian, thank you. And a seven point lead here for St. John's. As high as 12, as low as three here in the second half. Okafor is out. Robertson comes back in. So a much smaller lineup for UConn. Loaded with potentially good shooters. Now for a while there, St. John's was automatic from the line. Made 13 in a row at one point, but here in the last few minutes, not as good. Well, you mentioned it's the last few minutes. Things get a little tight. You know, guys have to rely on that muscle memory and not think about it. They've now missed five of their last six, and for the umpteenth time tonight, St. John's had left has left the door just to crack open for UConn. And right now the team that's on the floor for UConn was instrumental in making that huge comeback in the middle of this half. Brown turns the corner. Floater no got it back. Boy he is strong. Block. Butler the put back. It's a five point game. And timeout UConn. I believe that is it for them. Final timeout taken by the Huskies still with a minute 26 to play. I tell you what, it's not only about strength, it's also about desire. I think Talik Brown recognized and had a sense of urgency on that play. We'll step aside for a moment. Come on back for the final minute and change. St. John's leading by five. The Huskies just used their final timeout in an effort to come back and pull one out here against St. John's. Jim Calhoun ejected in the first half. Dave Lato teed up here in the second half and keep in mind St. John's leading by five and they've hit five technical free throws. I think Hatton missed one of two on the Lato technical so that's another difference in this game both Calhoun and Lato feeling they were getting the short end of the stick from the officials. The significance of this game UConn leading the East Division just a half game ahead of Miami Miami taking on Boston College tomorrow on ABC St. John's in the third at five and five but a win here for the Johnnies tonight would be uh, if not their largest win of the season certainly one of their top two or three along with the wins over Wake and Miami and here's the upcoming schedule for the Red Storm you'll see them on ESPN against Boston College next week huge one at Miami Wednesday Notre Dame coming to town and oh yeah a trip to Duke.
<laughs> well, you Thanks know a lot. Yeah, well, you know what? That Duke game is going to be looked upon as a get ready game, a game to build your confidence and maybe sneak with, sneak out with a win. But their uh, their fortunes are in their own hands over the next three games within their division. Tony Robertson has fouled out. Just two points on the night. So Okafor's gone. Robertson's gone. So it looks like the lineup the rest of the way is going to be Brown and Gordon in the backcourt. Here comes Scott Hazelton into the game. Now for Connecticut, has played sparingly tonight, but a guy who does have some good offensive ability. Redshirt freshman who missed all of the last year, recovering from a broken foot. Stanley at the line. Don't forget, coming up next, Missouri and Baylor. We'll send you there as soon as this one is done. One of two for Stanley. Oh, what a battle, huh? I mean, the people grabbing and shoving under the basket. Well, there hasn't been a clean rebound, and I don't know when. Somebody's gotten a hand on it. Somebody's tipped one. And it's still two possession yeah, ball You're right. Butler spins on Emmanuel, puts up the 15-footer. Tap is good for Selby. And that's what I mean. Selby was taken out earlier on the offensive end in and had Robertson in his place. That's the guy you need there who's going to put back the misses. Timeout St. John's. They will have one more timeout left. UConn is out of timeouts as the Huskies creep back within four. The way St. John's is starting to miss free throws. They'll let UConn back into the game again. Less than a minute away, barring overtime from Missouri and Baylor here on ESPN. St. John's 67, one timeout remaining. UConn 63, out of timeouts. St. John's ball. Manhattan a good free throw shooter. Brown tried to slap it away. Once again, the ball's in the wrong hands. You got to do something right now. Well, they almost got him. A foul is called as the ball came loose. That's what I'm talking about. I, you know, you got to say this. You got to call a foul when they foul them. Then there's an opportunity to take the ball, and then the foul's called, and you get an explosion. Right there's the foul. Right there's the foul. And now they have an opportunity to get it. It looks like he fumbles it, and then the foul is called. And again, you're not going to blame. If you're UConn and you lose this game, you can't blame that on the officials. You had your opportunity. But in situations like that, it's a question of consistency once again. And it's tough on that end. You know, certainly St. John's can put it all to rest by taking advantage of the opportunity given them. And they've got the right guy at the line. But I guess, again, as a fan watching this game, you can kind of empathize with, with Jim Calhoun and his frustration. And Dave Lato felt some of that same frustration in the second half. And certainly Mike Jarvis has seen some of it as well as calls similar to that have gone against him as well. 24 points for Marcus Hatton. Where they get out on Gordon in a hurry and then Hatton stops the clock. The last thing that Mike Jarvis wanted to see because now Gordon shoots a couple. Yeah, Mike buried his hand, his face in his hands after that one because I guarantee you in the huddle that's what he focused on. Guys, don't stop the clock to give them an opportunity to score. We don't need a foul. He's aging by the minute. He's winning. Oh, man. Now, that hand's dropping a little bit lower now. You can see some of his face. Well, you know, he just changed positions. I think that miss made it a little bit easier to breathe. Yeah. Now if I'm UConn, I got to find Hatton and I got to get in front of him. I got to deter the pass, make somebody else get it before I foul. No, well, they get it into his hands. And then a foul in the corner. Again, UConn trying to trap, force him to give up the ball, but they commit the foul with 37.9 to play. Hatton has made 15 of 17 free throws here tonight. So if you're St. John's, there is nobody else you'd want at the line. 
Oh, absolutely. And he's been the guy throughout this game that's taken the brunt of the Connecticut defense and made things happen. I mean, you talk about Andre Stanley and his ability to do all the little things. Sharif Fordham using his guile to get loose balls. Emmanuel making big plays along the baseline. You know, you've got a ton of contributors to St. John's, but at the end of the day, this is the guy that wins the ball game for them. Not only with his scoring, his coolness on the line, but his ability to create for other folks. Now a three possession game. And Brown hits and is fouled. Do you believe it? No. <laughs> Does Mike Jarvis believe it? Salik Brown doing what he needs to do. Didn't look for a three. Took it. Tried to get a quick two. And all it took was putting your hands up, allowing the basket to go. Make sure you get it in bounds. You know you're going to get fouled. You know you're going to trade if you're St. John's. But obviously it didn't sink in everyone. Lover commits the foul. Brown hits the free throw. Four-point game. Fordham to Stanley. Precious seconds. I can't believe it. No, the one can catch. no one can catch him. And Patton gets the ball back. Oh, man. And Dave Lato is incredulous. He said, why didn't you pull a foul down there? Well, Dave, you know, you played in a pretty good play, but you can't play this game for these guys. You know, you talk about Mike Jarvis teaching during the timeouts. And I think there's going to be some teaching going on in the video review for the Huskies. You know, these are missed opportunities. And this is how kids grow. There's no question about it. You can hardly bear to watch. <laughs> he and Jim Calhoun and Dave Lato have all been through the ringer here tonight in what's been a very hotly contested and physical scrappy game. A ton of fouls, turnovers. One last gasp, perhaps, for UConn. Gordon, no. Butler, yes. Three-point game. Glover looking for somebody to give the ball to. He can't find anybody, and now he has to go to the line. 68% on the season, five for eight tonight. Well, if Anthony Glover wants to keep this from getting real interesting, all he's got to do is knock these free throws down. But I'll tell you, both of these coaches, while they have a lot to work on with their team, they certainly have a lot to be proud of. You know, if you're Jim Calhoun, Dave Lato, George Blaney, and the rest of the staff, these guys battled back from adversity. You know, particularly from the technical foul standpoint and the free throws made by St. John's. Oh, boy, says Mike Jarvis. And certainly Mike Jarvis has to be proud of his guys, at least up to this last 16 seconds. Chad Wise into the game for the first time now for Connecticut for Scott Hazleton. And Wise is in the game because of his athleticism and the fact that in the event Connecticut scores, he's a guy that can foul. He's a fresh body, no fouls on him, and he's the guy that you look to to take the brunt of the foul if they have one more in them. Missed it. A three can tie it for Connecticut. Brown wants Gordon, can't find him. Butler, fouled. Karan Butler was fouled and will shoot three free throws. <laughs> Man. We have seen it all and then some just in the last four minutes of this game. We talk about being a teaching exercise. I think this is a semester's worth right here. Again, there's the play. Butler behind the three. Get a hand in his face. That's all you got to do. You're not going to block this shot. And it was a senior, no less. Yep. Karan Butler, 77% on the season. Three for six tonight. Donald Emanuel committing the foul. That gives Connecticut a golden opportunity to tie the game. And while it might be tough on Connecticut if Butler doesn't make all three, they will still have an opportunity if he makes the last one to foul, get some misses, and get another chance. Yeah, turn it around one more time. Yeah. 
I just can't believe some of the things that have happened in this game. <laughs> and most of them happening in the last few minutes. Butler with three. St. John's has one timeout remaining. But I got news for you. He had three free throws. This is the one he absolutely cannot miss. <laughs> now Mike Jarvis will use the timeout before the final free throw. Come on back and join us. Five seconds still to go. Hard to believe after all this, all the fouls, Jim Calhoun getting ejected, a couple of silly free throws from seniors down on the other end of the floor. St. John's finally did it. They finally let Connecticut all the way back into the game, and they're potentially just one Karan Butler free throw away from this game being tied. Well, I wasn't overstating the issue. Of course, you got to make it because you got a chance to tie. But in, with three free throws, he could have missed one. And as we said before, Connecticut would have had a chance to foul. Go down, hope St. John's misses, and even if they made two, had an opportunity to tie the game one more time. Now, if he misses, the ball is loose. There's an opportunity for St. John's to gain possession, throw it down the floor. Anything can happen while the time ticks away for Connecticut. So if he was going to miss one, it should have been early, but certainly not now. This one to tie. Ice water. Going for the win. Oh, and overtime is on the way. Hey, Huskies, the game's not over. Yeah, Connecticut acting like it is over, but three huge free throws from Karan Butler. Well, certainly a sigh of relief. If St. John's needed to draw a play, they couldn't have done it any better but putting it in Marcus Hatton's hands and making him create and Karam Butler he deserves that but I'll tell you what I've seen enough games to know that when you force a game to overtime and you're the team that comes out and you celebrate or even over celebrate there's a tendency for you to let down in overtime overtime on the way here in New York seven seven one nine five oh two well, without Jim Calhoun ejected in the first half, without Emeka Okafor and Tony Robertson, both of whom fouled out late, without seemingly a prayer of getting back into this game, the Huskies got back into it. They took advantage of a couple of ill-advised fouls by the Red Storm. St. John's missed a lot of free throws down the stretch. Karan Butler, three free throws with five seconds to go. And when Marcus Hatton's runner rolled off the rim, overtime was in our future. Remember, Notre Dame and Georgetown went four overtimes today in the Big East. The Irish winning 116-111. Simply a case of poor execution and mental lapses on the part of St. John. Hat, no. Glover the rebound and he's fouled. And neither team can afford a mental lapse here. Johnny Selby not doing a good enough job of blocking out. This is where you have to be even more fundamentally sound. Every play is magnified in overtime. Coming up next, Missouri and Baylor. We've talked about it. We've promoted it. We've previewed it. That's all we can do, fellas. we got to wait till this one's over. Then we're going down to Waco to jump into the Big 12 with Chris Marlowe and John Sunbold. So Okafor, Robertson out for Connecticut. Glover and Emmanuel. Each with four fouls for St. John's. Emmanuel not in the game right now. Rebound Butler. Boy, he has been huge. 24 points and 13 rebounds tonight for Karan Butler. And here's the dangerous defense that St. John's had played earlier. And Talik Brown and the backcourt of Connecticut recognized this 1 3 1 and was able to drive against it. Talik Brown drives against it again, just as you said. 
Again, the 1-3-1 one, one creates too many opportunities, too many gaps to drive against, get in the paint and create something. You got to tighten it up if you're St. John's. Nice job, nice duck in move. The foul is before the shot. Len, this lead that UConn has is their first lead of the entire night. Well, we talk about the zone. You take a look right here. You see the room. It takes too long for Glover to come over and help Hatton in that 1-3-1 one, one zone. Brown recognizes it. It's just a one-on-one -on -one situation rather than a helping zone situation. On the other end, though, Anthony Glover, an excellent job, fundamentally sound, of ducking into the paint, making himself big to get to the free throw line. Where tonight he is now 7 for 13. Mike Hayes back in for Connecticut. Scott Hazleton's going to go out. The Red Storm went through a stretch late in regulation where at one point they missed six of eight free throws. Hey, this is where UConn misses Oka for the most. In situations like this where St. John's is looking to get inside the paint. You don't have that deterrent. Rebound Florida. Nice hustle. Gordon to the floor. Nice a tie up, and it's UConn ball. Well, you give Ben Gordon a terrific amount of credit that time. It looked as though Fordham had possession. He could have just as easily given up on it. But as soon as Fordham, Fordham fumbled for a moment, and how's that for a time? For a <laughs> Gordon was the man on the spot. <laughs> Some kind of effort to be dis displayed by both teams here tonight. Every play, it seems, ends with a couple of players on the floor. St. John's wants to stay in that 1 3 1. It may ultimately be their undoing. Gordon at the top right now. Steps in. 15 footer is good. <laughs> 76 74 Connecticut. Can't let him turn the corner. Johnny Selby. Got it off the glass. Huge bucket for Marcus Hat. 29 for Hat. Johnny Selby stepped out to try to help on Hatton, but Hatton was able to get past Selby, turn the corner, and get into the paint. Selby's job was to keep him from turning the corner. Again, we talk about execution. Like more of a 2-3 now, then, than the 1-3-1 you were talking about. Well, absolutely. They've tightened up right now. They've gotten a man in the middle. That man in the middle is Kyle Cuff. And he's got help behind him. Here's Brown. Boy, nice little stutter move there. Can't finish. Offensive rebound for Butler, and he's fouled. And you talk about a guy who's considered an All-American, potential Player of the Year candidate in the Big East. Just a sophomore, but the unquestioned leader of this team. And he has played like all that and more here tonight. Well, absolutely coming up big. Not only did he hit three consecutive free throws to tie this thing, but that offensive rebound was huge. Timeout on the floor. Butler to the line when we come back. Back here in New York, sellout crowd. Doesn't look like anybody's left. Tied at 76 in overtime. No charge timeout on that last play. Anthony Glover committed the foul on Karan Butler. Glover's gone. The first St. John's player to foul out tonight. Okafor and Robertson gone for a while now for Connecticut. And back to the line for the Huskies goes Karan Butler. 24 points, 14 rebounds for Butler. Well, we were told it was about 60% St. John's, 40% UConn, and you could hear the ebb and flow of the cheering as the night went along. And I think everybody's gotten a good night's worth of enjoyment out of the basketball game here tonight. But talk about a demoralizing loss for whichever team loses this game, especially if St. John's goes on to lose this game after the lead they let slip away. And not only that, Len, the way they let it slip away with bad fouls and bad free throw shooting. Well, I agree with you. The loser of this game, if it's St. John's, they're going to take it a lot harder than Connecticut. I will say this, though. You talk about a loss at this moment in time. Anthony Glover on the bench is a huge loss for St. John's because he's their only legitimate post-up player, a guy who compliments Marcus Hatton inside. Takes a lot of pressure off him when he can duck in and get the ball in the paint and create foul situations. Glover out. Eric King now in. Donald Emanuel hasn't played ever since he committed that foul on the three-point attempt by Butler at the end of regulation. Hat, no. Butler, rebound. 15th on the night. Almost stripped by Fordham.
when this one is done down to Texas Missouri and Baylor well underway needless to say as Gordon almost oh, again Boy, he's got some happy feet. Well actually it wasn't his feet he was getting fooled by the ball motion. His feet was, was solid. Mike Hayes wild hook rebound hat. Why Mike Hayes is touching the ball at this point in time is beyond Dave Lado for sure. Stanley no Eric King with a put back in St. John's leads. This came into the game with Glover fouling out. This is the time when Hayes should try to get himself on the weak side. Every time he hasn't had a whole lot of playing time today. You know he's not in the flow but certainly he can rebound. Butler's open there on the wing. He's been a go to guy this half. Gordon no and Fordham how many big rebounds has Sharif Fordham had tonight. Now again good poise from Marcus Hatton rarely out of control. Spin crossover to the glass left hand. <laughs> Perhaps matching his season high. And Butler is fouled before the shot. Well, once again, a close game situation. You spread the floor, you just put the ball in this man's hands. Give him a little high pick and let him work his magic inside. And without Okafor, there's no natural center in the middle to go to the penetration, as we remember Okafor did throughout this game. So Hatton pretty much has free reign in the middle. Butler at the line, Butler at the line again. Each team with one timeout. Just over a minute to play. He's You're relaxed, huh? He's supposed to be smiling. This is fun. <laughs> Two big ones again. What would you rather be doing? Not much. You know, ask some of these kids what they'd rather be doing. Playing a game like this in front of this kind of crowd. You know, they could be out working. That's right. So could we, you know. <laughs> Pretty fun for us, too. Patton finds Fordham, still plenty of time on the shot clock. Oh, pass to Stanley. And now, back to the QB. Tip no. Follow, yes! Kyle Cuff! Brown trying to go all the way, he's stripped. And they're still not fouling. Well, they got it. They got it. Do you believe it? That tip by Cuff was the fourth shot attempt in that sequence. Once again, we talked about the fatigue factor, and it tells on the offensive glass. Mike Hayes just got muscles underneath. He got pushed around, there's no question, and he had no help. St. John's by three trying to put it away again and it's been some kind of day in the Big East today. The first ever four overtime game in a conference history. Notre Dame beating Georgetown 116 111 Chris Thomas playing all 60 minutes. 22 points 12 assists Mike Sweetney 35 points and 20 rebounds for Georgetown. Villanova with a very big win for them and for the conference beating UCLA by one Brooks sales with a couple of big free throws late. And Seton Hall hanging on down into Morgantown to defeat West Virginia 85 to 79. Tomorrow, ABC 230 Eastern Regional Coverage, Miami and Boston College in a big game in the Big East East Division. And again, if Connecticut loses and Miami wins tomorrow, then you've got yourself a new leader in this division, but there is still a month of basketball to go. St. John's tonight. 22 offensive rebounds three of them in that last sequence ending with the tap by Kyle Cuff. So Luke Brown has fouled out of the game. Marcus Hatton back to the line. Look at how many shots he's missed. He's doing all his damage from the line. Well absolutely again he's the guy that has been able to handle the ball and make things happen and UConn hasn't done a very good job of denying him the ball. If you're going to live with him having possession, he's going to put you away in these types of situations. 
33 points for Marcus Hatton, a season high. History suggests it ain't over yet. Wise looking for Gordon for three. Can't find Gordon, so he goes inside, and Selby bangs went home. Timeout, Connecticut. Hey, you got to give Chad Wise some credit now for a guy who doesn't play an awful lot. In fact, very little. He was very cool under pressure with the ball. He could have just as easily hoisted yeah, it up and ran right. in the locker room. Now we showed you the standings in the East Division in the Big East Conference. Let's look at the West after that big win for Notre Dame over Georgetown today. All of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but the Irish have won five in a row, and they're a major factor in this conference right now. Mike Bracey playing very well. 17 and 6, 7 and 3 in the conference. Pittsburgh and Syracuse, by the way, will play tomorrow. And then you look at the the middle of this conference, teams like St. John's, like Georgetown, like Rutgers, like Seton Hall, like Boston College, like Villanova. They're all scrapping away, trying to make a move on the leaders. If you tuned in 48 minutes ago looking for Missouri and Baylor, we had a little bit of extra action here tonight in New York, and we're going to the Big 12 when this one is done. Now the team that lost the lead at the end of regulation in the lead right now and the team that celebrated at the end of regulation and you can understand given the, the deficit they overcame they're in trouble right now Mike Jarvis who has to be five years older now than he was about three hours ago <laughs> his team is on the verge of a huge huge win for them well again I mentioned that at the end of regulation the team is makes a valiant effort a monumental effort to tie it usually has kind of an exhale factor the pressure is off they feel better about themselves but they also lose that discipline that momentum that it took to get them to that point and it seems that UConn essentially went flat once overtime began and certainly St. John's continued to attack they recognize what got them there they recognize their not so secret weapon in Marcus Hatton and how to use them and they've done it to perfection in this overtime period and they couldn't keep the ball out of Marcus Hatton's hands so he's going to go to the line again he is one made free throw away from a new Big East record 21 made free throws knocking Danielle Marshall out of the record book that's a little bit of irony yeah Still a two possession game unless of course well, we won't even say it. let him shoot fellas let him shoot loose ball underneath Butler two point game.